right. OK, so I shall step on the I'm going to cover. Um, I mean, Keith, Keith and the team asked me to talk about how you can self, how you can set yourself up now for a fast recovery. Um, how you can just not just get through this, but actually take a competitive advantage of of this. All the uncertainty, the changes that we're going to see. How can you set yourself up to come out ahead of the pack? Um, and I'm going to talk about three concepts that that I think will make a huge difference to you. Um, they'll help you adapt to the the changes that we're going to see in the short term and they help you to plan for a future that that obviously we can't really plan for because we don't know what it's going to look like um and the first one is is scenarios so scenario planning is something you can do in exactly these kind of circumstances um i'm sure you've heard about it i don't know whether you've done it before but i'm going to talk a little bit about how you do it how you use the the, the scenarios and how you get most value from them the second is something I touched on in the last call, which is the concept of having playbooks instead of plans and how important that's going to be, particularly when you start to work with scenarios. And the third is how you bring those two things together into what I grandly call adaptive strategies. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what they are and what they look like and how they're different to normal kind of traditional business plans and how you can pull them together really quickly while you're in lockdown to help you get through this. Um, Seriously, ask questions as you, as as we go along, um, either verbally or or via Keith. Um, the more questions you ask, the more value you, you'll get out of this. Now, the first thing I said on the kind of the stuff which went out in advance was that I just share some insights from what I've seen in the last last months or so. So the first thing is the speed of change. So this has come incredibly quickly, and stuff has changed incredibly fast and a lot of people, I think, are probably still in a degree of shock, still firefighting that. Um, the second thing is the trends that we had before tend to be the ones that have been really kind of super supercharged. The technology trends, the remote working, all those sort of things, that they were trends anyway, but they've just gone supersonic overnight. The third thing related to that is that the businesses that were ahead on those trends, who were already doing online collaboration and, and using 3D tools and remote monitoring, those businesses are the ones which have lost far less pace than the others. They've found it far easier to keep moving and keep adjusting. And similarly, at a personal level, it's the individuals I'm finding that the people who we would probably have classified as being the people that wing it, you know, the people that appear to make it up as they go, the very flexible people, the, the people who are used to kind of customising bespoke, thinking on their feet. Those are the people that psychologically are having a far less difficult time with this, the people who are used to planning, who are used to having everything kind of ordered, they're the people who are really struggling with this massive uncertainty that we're facing at the moment. But what I'm also seeing is, in terms of leadership, the really, what I would call the smart leaders and the ones who have the ability to, to keep spending money that aren't sort of a, a really difficult financial position, those are the ones that are thinking about repurposing rather than cutting. And I don't just mean, I mean, repurposing in terms of equipment or brew dog making sanitizer or you guys, you know, fabricators making sinks. And, and beyond that as well, they're repurposing teams, repurposing people and moving them into so little SWAT teams that can start to really think about the innovations that you're going to need over the next few months and years and what this is going to look like when you come out of this. And it's those those same leaders are the ones who are moving also from firefighting to thinking longer term, getting back into the long game about competitive advantage and positioning in the aftermath of this. Um, and they've probably been doing that from what I've seen for two, three weeks. So they're already moving into that space. And they're using those um, kind of cross-functional teams that they're pulling out of the business to look at what are the big hairy challenges, what we might call the kind of wicked problems, um, that we need to solve. So things like, you know, if social distancing is going to last for another 12, 18 months, which it may well do, what does that mean for doing a, a full kitchen install in the same time window as you had before, but with just two people on site and working distance apart? You know, that's a that's a really tough problem. It sounds impossible to solve that problem. But if you can solve that problem, you will come out of this in a far, far better position, not just because you can do that stuff during lockdown, but because you'll have a load more productivity and a load more efficiency when you get out of this. And 
that's leading to them to to think about dramatically accelerating some parts of the innovation agenda. So the obvious things like technology and moving from 3D plans to 2D plans to 3D and virtual reality and remote working and remote monitoring, but also things like offsite manufacturing and the whole kind of process side of things. They're getting much deeper into the the operational realities of what these scenarios will look like and feel like and how they will need to adapt which means that they're following that up with looking at investments even now looking at how they can invest in capabilities in equipment in systems in um, innovations so that they're two or three steps ahead of their competitors many of whom are still kind of hibernating or reacting to the crisis and working out what to do next week and that, those are the people who are my recent, most recent conversations who are starting to kind of look now at 2021. What what does our and ask the question, what does our business need to be? What what is our business going to become? So rather than just assuming that we'll bring everybody back on for off furlough at some point and they'll come back into the same roles and do the same thing and we'll carry on working the same way as we did last year, they're starting to think now that actually with all of this stuff that we're pulling apart and these innovative ideas that we're having to start come up with do we want to go back to the way we were do we want all those people coming back and doing the same or do we want those people working fundamentally differently do we want the business to be working in a very different way possibly doing different things in a year or two's time and it's that transformational thinking that i'm now starting to observe in the people that i would describe as being really on the front foot on this and i just wanted to share that with you just to get a give you a sense of the diversity in response that I'm seeing, the people that are really starting to move with this and position themselves well for the future, and the people that are still kind of thinking of the past and struggling with the present. Um, fundamentally, those last five things really on there <coughs> are driven kind of A follows, B follows, C really, but they're driven from this concept of, of having a scenario or having more than one scenario that they can start to think about in a, in a much sort of deeper way. <laughs> and that brings me on to the kind of topic of scenario planning. And I know it's something that you'll probably all have heard about and maybe some of you have, have kind of touched on before. Um, but I want to just give you a couple of expert tips on this. Um, the first thing is that you need to focus your time on the stuff that counts. And we've already sort of seen one slide today with a load of trends from the US market. And, and you can Google on the internet and look at predictions for post COVID and, and you will be inundated with information, you'll be buried in different ideas and aspects of, of what the future might look like. And it's really easy to spend a huge amount of time looking at that stuff. The real value from scenario planning comes from when you pull out a couple of credible <laughs> provocative scenarios for the future and you properly immerse yourself in them for a few hours as a group so some of you who have been on kind of caesar seminars and stuff with me before or masterclass sessions you may have done this and i would have given you a really provocative scenario to help you just kind of get your head around the process and that might have been something like if amazon bought your biggest competitor what would you do if you lost 50 percent of your customers tomorrow what would you do and whenever I do this, you, you get kind of three types of response generally. And this is no sort of dispersion on the people involved because it's very natural. So you get a bunch of people in the room who will attack the premise, who will tell me why that is a really stupid scenario and why that would never happen. And that, that's that's great. And it may well be true, but it doesn't help them. And you get a bunch of people who kind of play with the idea, but don't take it seriously. So it's a ridiculous scenario. So here's a few ridiculous suggestions. But then you get a bunch of people who really do take it seriously, who kind of put themselves in that in that position emotionally and intellectually for a period of time. And they're the people that walk away with a very different perspective and some very new ideas. A lot of those things they then decide to do anyway. And I'll give you a sort of a classic example. So another association um, in another sector, NCVO, uh, they, they're the National Council for Voluntary Organisations, and they've got about 14,000 nonprofit members. In 2012, they did a scenario planning exercise looking at what would happen if the government, because the government at the time was just getting into its austerity mode, what would happen if they cut their funding by 50%? Because at the time, I think 45% of that association's income was a government grant. And that scenario, what would happen if the government cut that in half? 
and that drove them to make specific investments so they they refitted two of the floors in their building and rented them out they created a whole load of meeting room and conference facilities that they now market and, and they also developed a, a whole raft of paid member services from training and and um the sort of kind of things that we're familiar with but to to parliamentary round tables to consulting services to online training resources etc and in the end as it happened the government didn't cut their funding by 50 percent; they cut it by 95 percent so they went from 45% grant funded to 2% grant funded over the period of two or three years. And they didn't get the scenario right, clearly, but they got the direction right. And it was enough to provoke them into action to do stuff which actually would be sensible to do anyway, because nobody is going to turn away a whole bunch more income. But actually, that scenario saved their bacon totally. They wouldn't be the organisation they are now, even if they existed, without having really thought about that scenario. And because it was provocative, it created a burning platform for them to actually do stuff, for them to invest. And that's the most important thing about scenario planning is you come out of stuff with big ideas, some of which you will do anyway, some of which will be triggered by, you know, different different circumstances. I've just kind of popped up a, another slide. So, so you know, you, if you focus on the stuff that counts, if you get the direction right, it doesn't matter about the details. If you if you use those kind of what I would describe as pragmatic extremes, so it's possible, but it's an extreme scenario, mm -hmm. that will give you far more food for thought. The idea of scenario planning is it needs to make you feel uncomfortable. If it doesn't make you uncomfortable thinking your way through that scenario, then it's probably not going to be helpful because it's not going to provoke you to really think differently and come out with ideas. And those ideas will fall into these two camps either there'll be options that you need to put on the back burner to be triggered if it starts to emerge that that scenario is going to happen or more often than not it's stuff that is a good idea to do anyway because it will set you up for now and set you up for the future like that scenario that i described around um you know being able to install the kitchen with two people in in the same window as you'd probably do it with a team of six going in there now it's a it's an important scenario to explore and the one about, you know, if your pipeline disappeared by 50% that I, I would have typically thrown out in sessions before, that's still a really useful scenario to explore right now. Not saying that that will happen, but if it did, what would you do? If, if say, 80% of construction product projects suddenly got knocked back because everybody was worried about the demand for new office space or new canteens or whatever those projects are going to be, what would you do? And not saying that that's going to happen, and I'm saying that if, if you really properly explore that scenario, you will come up with a whole load of things that you wish you'd done six months ago or other ways to, to fill your pipeline of different things. And you'll look at those and you go, you know what? There's a whole bunch of this stuff that we should be doing right now anyway. So that's the point of scenarios. Um, and for the next 12 to 18 months, I think that's going to be the basis of planning. So my challenge to you would be, you know, you need to think about this. What are the scenarios that you would take seriously for the next 12 to 18 months? Not necessarily what you expect to happen, but what could happen that's a bit more extreme that will provoke your thinking. So what's the direction and how severe might it be? And I'll give you some little bit of food for thought on that in terms of um, two things. Really, The first is that last time we spoke <clears throat> about three weeks ago, I gave you this picture of, of phases that we can expect. And at the time I said that we're going to go through an anxious reopening and that anxious reopening could easily last until this time next year, because when we come out of this, there will still, you know, we can't lock down forever. We can't lock down for a, a day more than the government can afford to, really. Um, so when we start opening, there will still be sick people out there. There will still be infection out there. There will still be a lot of pressure on the NHS. There will still be social distancing probably for quite a long time because you're not probably going to get a vaccine until this time next year at the earliest. And those are the kind of things that close us down. And, you know, all of this is now part of the national conversation. I think you guys probably got this um, three weeks earlier than most people. Um, but but that anxious reopening will take a long time. And that new normal, I think some of the things that I talked about is, you know, will universities go back to having lecture theatres? Probably not. Will, will office space still be at the same premium as it is now? Almost certainly not. And what are the knock-on impacts for that? And things like transport on things like, housing prices in the commuter belt and on, on all those kind of services, catering facilities that operate around the idea that you have 
hundreds of thousands of people coming into the centre of cities and working in these big blocks and then going away again at the end of it. There are potentially long term changes that come out of this. And um, one of the things that I said was that I think the CBI had just come out with the, the you know, this is a V shaped recession forecast. And I question that because when you look at the other forecasts and even more so now, since we've come a couple of months in, as far as the economy is concerned, the consensus and IMF and the city's traders are still a little bit more pessimistic than some of the institutions. But generally, the consensus is that there's a 10 percent to 20 percent drop in GDP this quarter for the UK. There'll be a degree of bounce back in the second half, depending on how quickly things unlock and depending on stimulus, things like VAT cuts and that sort of thing. But overall, the forecast for GDP for this year uh, for the UK are, are to be down five to eight percent versus last year. And next year, something like three quarters of that should come back, again, depending on the <laughs> forecast. Um, but assuming that we don't get another shock, assuming we don't get a big second wave and another lockdown, assuming that Brexit doesn't go all you know terrible, etc., then it will be around 2022 by the time we get back to sort of mid 2022, by the time we get back to 2019 levels. And alongside that GDP forecast, you've got other macro impacts within all of those forecasts around continuing uncertainties about second wave Brexit, that sort of thing, which will affect consumer confidence about levels of unemployment moving back up to sort of seven to eight percent, the same as it was at the financial crash. Wage growth behind inflation again for the next two years and government debt increasing by probably around 300 billion over the next two years to, to be an over 100 percent of GDP by 2022. That's that's the central forecast. That's not an extreme one. And that's about, about a third more in terms of percent of GDP than it was at the height of the austerity piece. So in terms of the way that local government funding and central government funding funds infrastructure projects, those things may be affected by us. I'm not saying they will, but it's a scenario that we need to think about based on those economic forecasts. So I thought I'd just kind of reflect on that and share that back with you. And, and the key points to take out of these, the eight, nine and ten on that slide is around you need to explore these uncomfortable scenarios because that's where the insights are. That's where the ideas for innovation, for really big innovation will come from. And you need to then challenge people within your organization, you and your teams, to find solutions, find innovative solutions to the really big issues that are potentially going to emerge over the next six months. And then take them into you know, what I'm going to talk about next, which is that kind of playbook strategy around having those options. And I mentioned um, playbooks last time. So just to kind of recap on that, because I've got quite a few questions afterwards, and they're all good questions, and it's because I throw these words out and, and then, then explain them. Um, but a playbook, the, the, the word playbook, it comes from professional team sports, because in professional team sports, it's impossible to make a plan for an entire game, It'd certainly be on the first minute or two, because you need to be able to react to what's happening. So if, if you're playing kind of you know double tennis or volleyball or something like that, you're not going to keep serving the ball into the exact same place because because your opponents will know and they'll be ready to, for whatever you're doing. And likewise, you don't want to just kind of make it up every time you you, you kick off because your teammates won't have a clue about where to prepare for the return, how, where to move, you know, and all sorts of things. And you see this in in you know, so in American football, if you've ever watched American football, you've got the classic thing with the quarterback who'll shout half a dozen numbers and then he'll go hut, 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 and then he'll throw the ball. And then he's calling a play from the playbook and he's based basing that choice of what play to call on on the sort of in the moment factors like you know how many yards they've got left to get how many downs they've got left where they are on the field how the opposition's lining up in front of them all those sort of things so a playbook is about choices whereas a plan is about a sequence of action a playbook is about a situation and a series of options that you can kind of leap into depending on the the situation and most importantly that your team already understand so we have a playbook for this and you've probably already got playbooks in your head you just don't recognize or formalize them necessarily so you, know, you will have a playbook in your head for say handling a supplier price request you know you'd know what options you'd normally consider you know you'd kick it back or you'd accept it or you'd negotiate or whatever and and you'd probably know what what's going to drive your choice in terms of you know balance of power and other considerations and the, the smart businesses get those playbooks out of people's heads and onto paper so that everybody understands them and everybody knows how they can make the calls themselves and, and what to do when a particular call is made 
without having to be kind of, you know, talked through it and given a three line whip every time because you understand the playbook. So the question is, you know, what is the playbook for working on sites that are closed today? Or we're working on sites that that might open in a few days and then close again, but only if, or ones that are only open for one or two people to work on at a time. You know, these are all scenarios that potentially you're going to face. What are the playbooks for those? What are the options that you have in those situations, whether to outsource or whether to to do X, Y, or Z? I mean, I, you know your business as far better than I do. But whenever the key principle is, whenever a decision needs to be context specific, where it's where you, you could make a different decision each time you have to make it because of the context, that's when it's really valuable to formalize a playbook. And we're going to go through a, quite a long period where that's absolutely relevant now. Um, and it also means that because you've got a playbook rather than the plan, you're constantly looking for different options to add into these different ways of resolving these problems. You're building your plays, building new plays into your playbook. And it's a really useful tool. And not only is it a useful tool, it's actually going to give you a competitive advantage in this space because you can make fast decisions while other people are floundering around each individual one. You've got a playbook. You know what you're going to do. And the gold standard for, for that kind of playbook philosophy is when you can take that from the operational decisions and how you can, you know, sort of empower people to make those decisions based on playbook, how you can take that philosophy right up to your strategic plan and apply it to investments and projects and chunks of people and pieces of work and those sort of things to, to apply the same thing. And that's that's where we get to this concept of adaptive strategy. And the, the basis for this, so I started using this probably three, four years ago, this type of approach with businesses um, that were doing primarily high risk innovations um, where you don't know what's going to work and you don't know what's going to happen, but also in sort of particularly volatile environments. And it's it's a model that I've started using more and more for more clients, particularly now, because now is, well, everybody's in that situation now. So, and what I'm seeing is a lot of people actually basically running without plans at the moment. You're just making it up as they go along because the plan that they had has gone out the window and they don't know how to plan with all this uncertainty. And, and this is where that kind of adaptive strategy model really comes to the fore. So the, it's explicitly designed, I guess, to be continually adapted and updated as you learn more, as things change, as new ideas and stuff come along. So it's not just a, a set of plans and milestones for dates for projects and initiatives. It's a it's a living model. I'm going to ask um, somebody who's used it to talk in a second, but just to kind of give you an overview. Rather than having your your big plans, you break those into chunks. You break those into individual kind of modules, if you like, of work that have got big assumptions around those. So your assumptions around, you know, what it will cost, how the benefits will come back, what the build curve will, curve will be over time. You know, if you recruit a new person, how long will it take them to get up to speed? How long will it take them to become productive, etc. cetera? Um, the same with your current projects, the same with your sales pipeline. They're all kind of modularized in this dynamic sort of forecasting spreadsheet, for want of a better, better word. And because you've got dates and stuff all associated with these and, and curves associated with them, you can move these around. You can change those assumptions. If a new idea doesn't seem to be taking off in the market or or if a prototype that you've got out there doesn't, isn't getting the traction, you can dial down the expectations on it. And you can immediately see the impact that that has on your forward cash flow, on your future P&L for this year, next year, et cetera. <clears throat> so you can model scenarios really quickly. You can sit in a room with a team with this on the screen and within 20 minutes, you can basically build two or three different strategic plans and just look at the financial implications of them. It's that kind of tool. And it's that that's the tool which, you know, innovation led businesses are used to using. Most of us are probably not. Um, <clears throat> but that's that sort of strategic plan with an inbuilt financial model that you can flex, you can adapt and you can continually evolve and tune, throw questions out, put different scenarios to. That's the kind of thing that most businesses need right now um so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just take us off the screen share for a second so you can see my lovely face again um and i know julian julian shine is on the call so i'm just going to ask if sarah jane can you just unmute julian i know it's a dangerous thing to ask but if you could just unmute julian and uh and put his picture up that would be Fantastic. Um, 
because Julian, um, you, you've got what I would call an adaptive strategy. I know that because we did it together last year. Um, would you just be able to talk through for a minute or two the difference, how that looks, how it works, and, and what it's what it's giving you, the benefit it's giving you through this sort of situation? Absolutely. Um, I'd just like to point out, first of all, this is the uh, third time in five weeks I've worn a shirt, so it's very uncomfortable. Um, firstly, uh, we started this process with Martin uh, around about seven months ago. Um, and when Martin says uh, he proposes uncomfortable uh, scenarios, yes, he did make us very uncomfortable on quite a few occasions. But um, if I look at where we are to where we were, um, we were probably previously fixated on the, the grand showpiece of a, a fixed annual budget um, and then looking at the operational delivery, diligently monitoring on a, uh, a weekly, monthly basis attainment against the budgeted figures um, and then looking at corrective uh, measures to take when we weren't actually hitting those budgets. I think what this playbook model has given us is a much more dynamic strategy planning tool. Um, we're able to much more rapidly change now our economic model to the, the changing economic circumstances. Um, and yeah, it, it's changing just about as quickly as I've ever known it right now. But our model is being changed on almost a weekly basis at the moment regarding the pressures that uh, we're seeing. Um, our dynamic model, it's made up of uh, separate investment cases, uh, each one uh, proving its worth individually and then looking at how this plugs into the, the overall model for the business. Um, it gives us the ability now to re-establish re whether the investment cases are the right thing for the moment or whether disinvestment cases should be looked at. Um, but each of these scenarios can be plugged into our model and create a uh, a coherent whole for us. So our model is constantly changing. Um, it's rapid uh, and we've got justifiable actions all the time now relating to whether to furlough, whether not to uh, furlough, um, what, how to engage with uh, the restarting of uh, sections of the business and looking at um, some of the previously considered nightmare scenarios that uh, Martin forced upon us and realizing that some of them are here and how we adapt the business now to to cope with these things that we've already considered. Um, it, it's almost like renewing your annual fixed budget once a month. It's just a, a much more coherent tool. Julian, thanks Julian. That's, so I, I, I asked Julian to speak about that primarily because um, you sometimes these things in the abstract are hard to grab it's only when you've got it in front of you that and you know and you've got the voice of experience just kind of explaining the difference it makes and your ability to to you know the, the difference that i see is the confidence the confidence in making decisions in making these calls and making these choices on a much faster basis um so so those are the the three main concepts that i want to share with you which is the scenarios that's the big one. The playbooks as just a methodology for dealing with uncertainty and for and for reacting far far more quickly, and then rolling up those things into a full kind of adaptive strategy based on that concept of having choices and being able to move things around and just being able to immediately see what how those scenarios might play out for you economically. Um, and I just I'll just kind of close with I, I think I said something rather grand on the. Um, Oh, the, the invite, which is around the kind of, you know, where are championships won? And the, the thing is that we can, you know, it, the diff, there's a fundamental difference. Um, and I'm seeing this and I, I suspect you guys are seeing this now. There's a fundamental difference between running a business in normal times in a relatively stable, predictable market where you can plan things and you can check things off on your, your to do list. It's not the same as growing a business and taking market share in times of huge change and uncertainty. It takes a different set of skills, it takes a different mindset, it takes a different approach, different tool set, and a different way of planning for the future. You know, it's, it's 
really clear that what got you here over the last few years is not the same as what's going to get you effectively through the next 18 months. And it's really important to recognise that because the longer we've been in our roles and, and there are some incredibly seasoned experts on this call, some absolute pillars of the industry. Um, but a lot of that expertise now is you're going to have to change the way you apply it over the next 18 to 24 months in order to really succeed through this this process. And the, the metaphor, the analogy that I use is you know, as a Sunday league team, you can turn up with a half a dozen really talented players who are just good enough individually to sort of make it up as they go along and you will win your more than your fair share of games. But top level championships are not won that way. You know, they're not won by talent alone. They need to get a different game plan. They won on the on the training ground. They're won in the in the technical room. They're they're won by the teams that come up with and practice new ideas every session that, that are constantly developing different plays for different situations. They're won by the teams that can adapt in the moment um, collectively and confidently because they know what they're doing together. And they've always got more ideas in the locker and they've always got more strength on the bench. And I don't doubt for a minute that there are kind of, you know, first class leaders with first class teams on this call because I've met a number of you. And I definitely say that that's true. But if we want to realise the potential to actually gain through the next 12 to 18 months, we need to start taking a world class approach to the whole game. And that includes how we plan for the future. And hopefully if you can take anything away from this call, it will be to start bringing in these things. And I'll just kind of share very briefly the, the, this last piece here which is, you know, to, to, to really accelerate your recovery, it is that combination of, of the, the scenarios, the difficult scenarios, the uncomfortable scenarios with the playbooks, you know, and taking those options into your playbooks and taking the obvious ones and just doing them and then building that, you know, whatever tool you use, whether you use the kind of thing that Julian's got or whether you use your own thing, but it's, it's creating that flexible approach to planning where you don't have a fixed plan. You have constantly evolving pieces of the jigsaw that you're building as and when they need to be built. That's the key to, to, to developing competitive advantage through this next term and to coming out much stronger. Now, I'm aware that without the chat, I'm afraid I've not been able to take any of the questions. So first thing I'll do is, um, while you all think of your wonderful, inspirational, challenging questions that make me feel uncomfortable, um, I'll pass back to Keith and ask Keith if there's anything come in or anything that he thinks will be worth clarifying or asking about. Keith. Um, firstly, thank you very much for that, Martin. Excellent presentation as usual. Um, we haven't got any chat questions coming in. I can see the chat down the right hand side and I've uh, put out a notice to say if you're having problems typing a question in to text me and I haven't had anything specifically on that. Um, Martin, if I may, a, a question just while anybody else is thinking and please follow up after this by unmuting yourself and, and asking the question directly. Um, what do you see? Um, how do you see the scenario planning relating to our industry as you know it? Because we see a very fragmented operator base. We see a very fragmented middle ground of dealer and distributors and we see fragmentation um, as far as manufacturers are concerned. What do you think are some of the broader base scenarios that as an industry we should be looking at? I think I'm just going to challenge the question a little bit because I think that that's a question that's really relevant to you as an association in terms of the industry landscape. Mm -hmm. The industry landscape is, is what you call a kind of an emergent property of the behaviours of the people within it. So what I'm seeing in other sectors, and I'm not going to comment on this sector because I know people within it and you know who they are, um, but certainly in other sectors, when people are looking at scenarios, they're looking at M&A, emergency and acquisitions, increasingly within those scenarios. So the, if the appetite is there within the sector as individuals to use this opportunity to consolidate, that will only happen if individual organisations take the initiative and actually make that happen. I can certainly see this being a really good time for that. You know, the, there are there are dangers around doing M&A out of distress 
because you know two businesses that are struggling to make money combined make one business that's probably struggling even more to make money and, and you never get quite the savings and benefits from efficiencies that you expect you get the benefits when you add one and one and make three when you when the additive business allows you to extend into a different geography or allows you to take some of their products and expand it across your your customer base you know there's the same arithmetic of merger and acquisitions is still relevant and whether that's vertically up the supply chain you know dealers and manufacturers etc or whether it's horizontally just in terms of consolidation geographically etc those are the things which as you go through these scenarios when you look at the really uncomfortable ones i'd be surprised if they don't start to get a new agenda what the emergent outcome from that in terms of how it reshapes the sector is will be difficult for me to kind of speculate on because you know it, it could go either way but i think over the next 12 months there's an awful lot of time for people to move out of the current kind of, oh my God, how do we get through this phase into the, what would be more sensible for us? And it's that kind of transformational thinking that I talked about at the beginning, which will come from individual leaders in individual businesses. They will be the ones on the first, on the first on the front foot, I guess, in terms of looking at where the MA opportunities are for them and, and where that kind of that consolidation or that reshaping of the industry makes sense for them as an individual business. Does that answer your question, Keith? Yep. Yes, it does. Thanks, Martin. Um, let's throw it open to the floor. Has anybody else got a question? If you unmute yourself and ask Martin, please. I've stunned you all. That's brilliant. OK. Um, OK, if uh, I don't know whether people are struggling to get on or not, what I, I know, Martin, you very kindly offered uh, the option for um, individuals to make direct contact with you for a, perhaps a 10 or 15 minute call uh, following the last webinar. Would that be open to our members in terms of what we've talked about today? Absolutely. So what I said last time is that I would Put aside, if anybody is an FEA member once, I'll <clears throat> just get in touch, drop me a note, and I'll put aside 30 minutes to have a call with you. Um, I know that there are several people on this call who have taken that offer up in the last week or two. Um, I, I'd i like to think, in fact, I know because I've had some emails back, but uh, you know, I know they found it really useful. Um, and it's totally compliment complimentary. There's no kind of, I think I said, no strings, no sell, no, 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 no nothing. It's just for you as an FEA member. Um, also, if, if that feels too, I don't know, too personal or, or too scary to, to speak to me in person, um, that's fine. I understand there's got, you know, there's resources on, on the FEA website. There's resources on my website at binleydrake.com. Um, you know, you could always talk to Keith about um, setting up another webinar or, you know, we've done masterclasses in the past. If there's enough of you and your colleagues to make a, a decent sized group to make it worth FEA doing it we can set up a, a masterclass on any of this and we could do that you know pretty sharpish in the next few weeks if needs be if this is really pressing for enough of you um so yeah you can call me um you can email me uh, you can go through Keith I'm more than happy to talk to any of you if it helps Okay, um, Martin uh, on behalf of, of us all and we've got some 55 on the call today um which uh, exceeds where we were on the first call so firstly thank you very much for the the, the thought-provoking presentation that you've given um and what i'd ask is for all of the members to come back and to talk to us about what those specifics are that we may need to address in future because what i'd like to do is perhaps pull down some of the specifics maybe there's a small group of you that would like to in a confidential manner look at scenario planning um, and certainly we can open that up to um, a, a closed group if that's necessary. Um, we want to be flexible to meet your needs as members based on where you are and what you're facing. And that's very much our role to be able to do that. And that's whether that's uh, external communication information or collating information together internally um, for you to be able to use to benefit. So. Let's um, all go away and give some thoughts to those scenarios. If you're willing to share them with me in a confidential manner, I'd be happy to collate them together and perhaps come back to Martin for a, a, a briefing session on what the generics might be 
that we could look at in future webinars. Um, but really to close off and thank you all for very much for your time this morning, especially to Martin for the insight that he's again delivered this morning, an excellent presentation and uh, certainly plenty to think about. So uh, on behalf of us all, Martin, thank you very much. Thanks, Keith, and thanks, Julian, for yeah. chipping in. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye.